The reason why we went into the teaching of the beauty of holiness uh, is because we realized that we need to understand more about holiness. We know what it is to be holy. We have a series on uh, holiness, that the essence of holiness is ownership by God. God owns. Whatever God touch and owns, that becomes holy. And, uh, so, it, uh, when he says, when God says the tie is holy, that means you cannot, when you, you never ever give your tithes. You only bring your tithes. How can you give something that never belongs to you? God already made claim this is His. And so, if you didn't bring it, it just means you stole it. And in the Bible, in the book of Leviticus chapter 27, they tie not just their finances, they tie their animal. So when it was king time to tie, and the tie is only based on the increase. So if the animals have increased another 10, uh, before they had 10, now they have 20. So it's the extra increase. So they tie on the 10. And uh, so the 10 animals, as, as they come 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, that 10 animals belong to the Lord. And they're supposed to count the animal and bring the animal to the Lord. And bring it to the Lord. It belonged to the Lord, to be given to the Lord as a tithe. The animal was a tithe. I know, because in those days, God set up a system where the Levitical priesthood would make use of those tithes. And uh, so, if the number 10 animal happened to be the best, chubbiest, lean meat, I heard a lot of classical music, so the masters are very nice. <laughs> like Hebrew music. And uh, then you want to change it with animal number, number seven. We were skinny little fellow. And uh, got sick many times, so never grow chubby. <laughs> and so you say, well, after all, ten. Just any one of the ten. But you have counted that one as ten. Because you, you, you cannot try to be outsmart God and purposely push push the animal so number 10 will be the skinniest. Don't do that. Because God is not so much concerned in the amount. He's concerned in the heart. And the same way, you know, uh, you say how, we, we don't have animals today, we give money. So, I'm sure nobody does that. But imagine sometimes when people give money, they say, hey, which one is the dirtiest one? Yeah. So it's the same way. You know, we don't do that. We just take and give. But it's just like they're, they're manipulating which animal to number 10. So if number 10 was the chubbiest, they change with another one which was skinny. God says, read Leviticus 27. God says, if you try to change it and exchange it, and instead of bringing number 10, you're bringing number 7, after it's 1 to 10 anyway. You know what God says in the Bible? He tried to change. Both belong to Him. <laughs> Dangerous. So we learn that holiness, and God said the tie is holy. That means, when, even before you bring it to the temple, before you bring it to God or give to God, uh, you never give it, you bring it to God, God already made His shock. This is mine. That's why the Bible never, read the whole Bible, you never say give your tithe. Say bring your tithe. However, you can give your offerings. Because anything that is, uh, uh, that is greater than 10%, that's yours to give. That's offerings. And so we have the understanding of what holiness means. The essence of it, I mean, how can a cow, you know, how can this animal become holy? It's because God owns it. And remember that even when uh, the, the bad people who were in a rebellion, Korah, the rebellion, they, they try to make an offering of some, in, some, some things and utensils, in, incense, and, uh, and, and then when they all die, the earth opens up and swallows them, and all the, the incense thing drops, uh, the incense carrier, sensors ca uh, all drop. God said to collect all of it because He said He has been dedicated to me. See, God reclaim ownership. So the essence of holiness is ownership by God. That's why there's such a thing as God tell, telling the people, the Sabbath day is holy because I claim that day. You borrow the time that day. So, uh, to the, of course, nowadays, you know, we know in, as in Christianity, we don't keep just one day holy, we keep all the days holy. But people don't understand what the concept of the Sabbath is. It's ownership by God even of the day. 
And whatever you're going to do today, you're going to ask God, Lord, could the day be used for this? And uh, so that's the concept of the Sabbath. And um, then the Sabbath is holy, and everything that God puts holiness on, He puts His ownership upon it. So the essence, and holiness has not been touched much, taught much. So we have taught a series on holiness, which you can revise it. And now we are doing series 2 on holiness, but we don't call it series 2, we call it the beauty of holiness. It's how to enter into, the, how to be inside the Holy of Holies. So this series on the beauty of holiness is trying to teach us how to remain inside. There, is, there are, of course, degrees of holiness. The very fact is that there is an outer court holy place and a most holy place, most holy place, or some versions say the holiest of all. That already tells you there are two degrees. There are multiple degrees of holiness. Even when a Zaya, who is a holy man, based on human perspective, when God's heaven, true heaven, open, even he cried out, woe unto me for a man of unclean lips. Which shows that heaven's holiness is even greater. So there are degrees of holiness. And we especially in this series were trying to teach us how to live inside the Holy of Holies. Because we said that Christianity starts there. We all start in Christ. The New Testament starts in Christ. We were born again in Christ. Your first steps was to receive Christ. We are not Old Testament. Old Testament is the outside going in. New Testament is the inside coming out that we have been teaching. And we have been teaching how to be inside all the time. How to ensure that you're inside all the time. So let's revise some of these things and as we go on in today's the good thing now for this uh, next whole month is that we're going to just be very regular in this teaching so you, you can remember it uh, over a week rather than over a fortnight. In the book of uh, Romans, let's look at the book of Romans again. The book of Romans and as we turn to the book of Romans chapter 8, we're going to invite... Although he's already working, I always love to invite once again the Holy Spirit and God Almighty and acknowledge Him. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Your Word is a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Hebrews 4 verse 12. Even dividing between the marrow and the bone. Your word touches the spirit, soul, and body. Let your word continually be confirmed. And we know this new level of anointing has already been working, having a visitation from the archangel who is in charge of signs and wonders. Where the people's faith has increased, they now know how to work together better with the angels. They now have faith for greater things. And we thank you, Father, that today you have absolutely healed them. So that all those sicknesses and diseases that have been afflicting them from time to time will disappear from their bodies. Bear witness to this word that comes from you, Father. And glorify your Son, Jesus. Confirm your word of holiness with signs and wonders. And let creative miracles flow forth also, Father. They all may know that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead and that you have sent your servant to bear this message to the body of Christ. We ask, oh Father God, in the name of Jesus, that you glorify Jesus once again. Hide me behind and inside you, that all may 
see Jesus and Jesus alone. That we will know that Jesus is alive, risen from the dead, and He once again walked the face of the earth through our living bodies, dedicated to you. Seal this word, Father, in our hearts and lives. Raise us up to this understanding you have for us. And establish your work in each one of us. Impart and seal the impartation of the Spirit in each heart. And the giftings and anointings. And bless each soul. Draw out the giftings. And seal your work in these physical bodies. The simple things, even though it's a complex thing for the medical world, the body was created by you. It's a simple thing for you to heal every ailment. And we exercise the authority given to us, authority over every sickness, every disease, and every demon, in the name of Jesus. They go off all, and they disappear as much as the mist disappears in a shining sun. So let the sun of righteousness shine upon each life and each heart and mind as your word is shared. And we covenant to always give you the glory, the worship and the honor. That at the peak of your manifestation, you will yield and step aside like the 24 elders cast our crowns at your throne and say worthy is the Lamb worthy is the almighty God to receive glory honor and worship to him and him alone be all glory honor and worship in Jesus name Father we ask and pray and everyone say Amen, Amen. let's turn to the book of Romans chapter 8 Romans chapter 8 and we see here that after he has established the fact about the law of the spirit being more powerful than the law of sin and death in verse 2 it says for the law of the spirit Romans 8 verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Now even verse 2 itself should tell you that power over sin is by nature, not by works. Not even by nurture. You must have nature before you get nurtured. If you are not even born, how can you be nurtured? But it tells us, it's the law of the spirit of life you must have the life and isn't it interesting that your power over sin is directly proportional to how much life you have not physical life biological life not soul life but zoe life which is the Greek word Z-O-E it's the law of life how much life is inside us? And he said, Is it possible? I thought all of us received the life of Jesus. Yes. We receive a measure of life. Which is like a measure of faith. A measure of the word. In Ephesians chapter 3, it tells us that even though we have an inner man, a spirit man that is born again, Paul prayed that their inner man would have more life. That's summarizing the whole long prayer in one word. He prayed that their inner man would be strengthened. And we have studied that the four Greek words for energy and life. That is based on Ephesians 1 and Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and chapter 3. In, both in Paul's prayer. Most Christians know the Two words for power, dunamis and, and exousia. Uh, technically, dunamis should be power, exousia should be authority. And then we also study the other two words, kratos and iskus. 
and Kratos based on Acts 19 and the word of God uh, grew mightily uh, grew in power, grew in strength and uh, that's the word Kratos and uh, then there is uh, uh, James chapter 5 where the prayers of a righteous man avails much that means very powerful it's iskus much so we study two other words for power which is inside some of our old teaching series uh, there is kratos and iskus and uh, so we introduce the concept of four Greek words for power about it was a long time ago uh, probably in the 1970s and it's gone and it's become part of the vocabulary now four Greek words for power but there are other words that this power flow through which is the word energets because all these are forms of energy there are four, four states of power but when they flow it's all energy which is the Greek word energets so in Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3 there's a, there's a play especially uh, there's a play on Greek words that your inner man will be strengthened that means you receive more of the life of God because all power comes from the life of God it's the life of God that contains power uh, that is why uh, Hebrews twists a turn in the way he express something and uh, hold that thought hold that place in Romans flip over quickly to Hebrews 1 and uh, it says here in chapter 1 of Hebrews verse 3 Jesus who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power instead of by the power of his word you know what the word of his power means? it means that his power is there and out of his essence and life and being and energy, he speaks the word. So his word has power. But the power of the word actually came from the life of God. That was behind me, behind it even before the word was spoken. That means the life and the existence and the energy of God exists before the word was spoken. And when he spoke, the word was contain the power. When you say the power of His Word, you're limiting His power to the Word. When you say the Word of His power, you say every word from that Almighty Being that we acknowledge as God Almighty is powerful. Even a whisper is powerful. Even one thought energy, the universe can change. That's how powerful our God is. So there is God and there is that that that, that portion of his life that we receive his life contains all this energy and power and that life gave us a born again spirit it produced in us a new spirit so powerful that our what happened to our old spirit because we were spirit beings before that spirit, soul and body what happened to our old one it just disappeared because the new one was so powerful and it just got absorbed you want to say it into it and uh, so there's this there's this power that is there it's just like uh, you know nowadays we have rechargeable batteries we use it all the time your phone and everything so usually your phone will reach a point uh, very few of us will wait till the phone completely dies out then we will recharge usually your phone will go to the point and it, it gives you a signal and say time to recharge the battery but actually still a bit, a bit of power you might be able to make a few more phone calls it still has some power but then it says recharge and then you recharge now when you recharge what happened to the old power it just joins together with the, the rest and become part of the power so what happened to the old spirit it just shoo, become part of the new spirit that's what an illustration if you're looking for one and uh, so there's no thing no such thing as old spirit new spirit right just one new spirit when you're born again there was a life of God inside you and that's your inner man. The spirit man is called the spirit man, the inner man, the hidden man. These are all uh, allegories or, or phrases referring to the spirit man. But in Ephesians 3, although they were born again, 
Although they had an inner man, the essence of the prayer was that the inner man continued to receive strength and life and the presence of Jesus so that the inner man will grow even more and grow even more. So that is the law of the spirit of life. We receive life. The key to overcome sin is not works. The key to overcome sin is not resolution. The key to overcome sin is not willpower alone. The key to overcome sin is not by just reformation. It is by transformation that depends on the life of God coming in. So the more we know how to let this life flow into us, the more powerful you are against the law of sin and death. And that's just only verse 2. We didn't finish reading. We haven't even got to the main point. All that you have is just desserts. Okay. That's why I take two services to finish this one. And uh, chapter 8, verse 2. And then he goes to verse 3. says, For what the law could not do. Notice the law cannot help. We, we, we talk about how the law cannot help. The law makes sin look more sinful. It does frighten us a bit. You know, you can motivate some people by making something bad look horrible and frightening. But it's not the cure. It is only a temporary crutch until the greater cure comes. That's what the law is. And uh, it is good. It is helpful. It is holy. It is correct, but there was no power to fulfill it. And chapter 3, what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. That's why the flesh needs the life of God. Notice, it was weak through the flesh. That is why in verse 9 it says, you are not in the flesh. He said, wait a minute, I thought we are still in the flesh. Technically, Paul don't want you, you to think of yourself as you're in the flesh. That's why some people, when they come for all night prayer, say, the flesh is weak, but... Uh, no, the spirit is weak, but the uh, spirit is willing. Spirit is weak, but the... Flesh is weak. Who is weak now? Flesh is weak. Flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. Okay. Okay, like, do you mean the right phrase now? Okay. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And that automatically tells them, I am now weak because I am in the flesh. Isn't it? When you keep thinking of yourself in the flesh, you become flesh. When you keep thinking of yourself as a turkey head, you get a turkey head. <laughs> Christmas is coming. <laughs> when you keep thinking of yourself as a lamb of meat, of course you become a lump of meat. So the Bible tells us, don't think of yourself like that. Look at yourself as, Paul look at, Paul look at him in verse 9, say, you are not in the flesh. Hey, you're writing to people who are reading the, the, his epistles and they're actually uh, flesh and blood beings. Say, you're not in the flesh. But in the spirit. How? If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Notice the same cure. Impartation of Spirit and life. You know the Spirit can be given in measure. Just as light can be given in measure. Faith can be given in measure. So the transformation is by nature. Something comes. Transforms your nature. Your inner DNA. And makes you into a person. Different from who you are. That is why only in God is it possible to take a demoniac and convert him overnight to be an evangelist. Jesus did that in the Bible. How many demons fill him? A legion. A man with 6,000 demons overnight became a faithful evangelist. You didn't even have time for Bible school. <laughs> He probably did better than a lot of people who went to Bible school. Nothing wrong with Bible school. We're going to start Bible school. I believe in education. That is of God, of course. The properly, the, uh, it has to be 
It has to be. People do still need to be trained. But only in God can be a such thing. How does God do it? By changing the DNA. How does He change the DNA? That's what this lesson is about. How we can put ourselves in a position to receive more of the life of God. And that was an accent. And part of the process was this thing to do with the mind. In between verse 3 and verse 9 was something about the mind. And the mind is connected to the keyword again. Say, what keyword? Life. Remember, life is important. You read so how important life was in verse 2? How important it was in verse 9? So you're wondering, how does this life flow? Correct. Thank you. Good question. Paul knew you were going to ask it. He wrote it nearly 2,000 years ago for you. So here it says in verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Let me set your mind on things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Everything. Thank you. I just have to do a few times a day, remember. Everything. But it's not mind power because it's not the normal words for thoughts. When you think you cannot fast, you cannot fast. I think your greatest achievement in the fast day was three days with water fast. Huh? Ten days liquid also. Okay, wow, 10 days liquid for them. So just stretch a bit, 40 days. <laughs> so, he has, uh, I remember your statement when you made it. Uh, and then when you went on a 3 day water fast, was after you heard I went on a 3 day, no water, no food, nothing, like a plaster over your mouth kind of fast. That means nothing goes inside. <laughs> 3 days. No food, no water. So, then you started a water fast sometime after that. Don't know our guilt or our inspiration. <laughs> we pray that it be our inspiration. <laughs> but you did it. And one of the statements that Eddie said to me was this. It was just a mental block. You found it easy. But part of the easy is not just because it's easy. Because the ministry, the preaching, and being part of it, there's life that flows. And also, when you see someone can do it, and that person is as human as you, what does it say about you? Right? They are made from the basic human DNA. Slightly different for each one, but basic human DNA. And all require oxygen to breathe. Food for our daily needs. But can do it means the possibility is there for all of us. For every one of us. So here we, we realize that the thought dimension is important. But in studying the book of Romans, we mentioned that Paul wrote it in Greek and as far as we have, the letters were written in Greek. And he knows, and the whole book was written in one long letter without chapters or verses. And he started using the word mind way back from chapter 1 and chapter 2 when he talked about uh, all these people who gave give them over to a reprobate mind. But all the time he used the word mind, and you can check it out in the Greek, or take Esau, which is free, and look at every word where the word mind occurs, you find that the word mind is nous, N-O-U-S. It's always nous, 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 nous for about four, five, six times. 
And then suddenly he reached Romans 8. He changed a different Greek word for mind. And then he changed it back to news, except one or two cases in book Romans. But otherwise, generally all news, N-O-U-S, which is the normal Greek word for mind. But here in Romans 8, he chose the word phronio for the word mind. Cardinally minded, or spiritually minded is phronio, P-H-R-O-N-E-O, Romanized. And then I ask you a hypothetical question. That you all might have forgotten, so you need to revise. Our soul has three parts. As far as Watchman Nee is concerned, your will, your emotion, and your intellect in the book of the spiritual man. Of course, your will has to make the decision, so it's decided it's quite powerful, so let's take away the will. And we say if there is a battle between your emotions and your intellect, the gorilla of your emotions <laughs> fight against the orangutan. <laughs> I know here in Malay we say orangutan. Australians like orangutan. <laughs> so the orangutan of the mind fight. <laughs> I thought you like movies, so. <laughs> So young ones is like your video game. <coughs> so the old, the gorilla fight against the orangutan. Let's say this is a black gorilla. This is a, a brownish red orangutan. <coughs> and let's pretend they're not the real gorilla and orangutan uh, out there because the gorilla tends to be bigger. So it's already unfair. Let's say that this is a cartoon version. Both are equally the same size. <coughs> And I ask you the question. <laughs> ask you the question. <laughs> and by the way, what you hear is not static. <laughs> Who will win? Which A will win? How many of you, you say? Okay, again, better ask the question. How many of you say in a battle between the gorilla of emotion versus the orangutan of your Intellect. When they fight, who will be? Okay, those of you who say emotions, raise up your hand. Thank you. Those of you who say your mind, raise your hands. Mm, thank you. See? Interesting, isn't it? So we need Bible examples. You can you can quote for human beings, right? Say, oh, in my life, this one, this one, I thought about this and then this one, and you can quote this one. Let's quote the Bible. Okay. Who is the third smartest man in the Bible? Well, you call first, you all will jump. Solomon. 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 So who was first? Thank you very much. It means you have heard the old sermons. <laughs> So, the smartest man, wisest man in the Bible must be Jesus. Any one of you say anybody else? You, you know, how dare you give Jesus anything lesser than the gold medal? Right, Jesus gold medal. Number one, yes, Jesus, yay! Number two, who got the silver medal? Olympic race of the internet. Adam, with Adam before he fell, he will be smarter than Solomon. After the fall, I don't know what will happen. Eh? The brain might be fried or whatever. <laughs> so, Adam before he fell, perfect. He will be smarter than uh, Solomon. So, the silver medal goes for Adam, yay! Then, Poor Solomon got bronze medal. But even his bronze medal, he was the smartest man in his time. But when I shared this sermon in, in Sydney yesterday, one of them said, Poor the hand. What about Daniel? In a fight of intellect between Daniel and Solomon, do you think who wins? Wow, see, this is how you're not sure, right? Not sure who will win. 
So you say Daniel is very suitable man. Then you're that. So who? So because I couldn't quantify it, I say Daniel is a different category. <laughs> It did say he was 10 times smarter than everybody else in his time. It did say he knew all the literature, all the science, all the Chaldean things. They were very, very clever. But when you look at what Solomon knew, he, he knew about animals, botany, he did so many things. So I would say, I'd rather not compare the two. So don't make these two, not gorillas, human beings fight. <laughs> uh, so that is a special category. But... In the meantime, we look at Solomon. Now, wouldn't you say Solomon was one of the smartest men, if not THE smartest man? High IQ, so high that you cannot count. Clever. But why such a clever man? So stupid. <laughs> <laughs> he married, he had 700 wives, 300 concubines. One not enough. He li literally took to the extreme. And so, if you have 1,000 wives and concubines, they probably don't even know you. You think about it, if you slept with one every night, it takes three years before they go one circle. <laughs> Because 1,000 days, you know, it's 365, 365, 365, so it's a slightly two, two, between two to three years. And I will assume Solomon, of, uh, Solomon might be busy a few nights and he might go visit his wife about twice a week. That even stretches it. So the one might not see him, I think once in 10 years. <laughs> so, what he made this stupid mistake that caused his kingdom, caused his reward, Lost 10 tribes of his son. God, God was going to reduce it even in his time the prophecy start coming forth. And why so smart? And then so stupid. Because the emotions win. He is a smart fellow. He could he could probably you know, speak about animals, birds, trees, plants, everything. I said the Bible though, very funny. Right? And the Bible never record that as a king he should write his own Bible. So I don't know whether he memorized scriptures. And so, so smart, he would say all those things, wow. And the Queen of Sheba come to visit him. People come to consult him, everything. He knew everything. And then one lovely lady says, Solomon and flutter her, 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 her eyes a bit. <laughs> I said, oh, 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 and we have like a food. So who wins? Intellect versus emotions. Now I know that sometimes some of us have a difficult emotional decision, and reasoning wins through. But you will analyze deeper. Behind the reasoning was a state of well-being. You know that this is the way of love. This is the way to feel honor. Honor has to be a, a sense of honor as well as an honor based on intellectual honor and principle. There's a sense of honor, a sense of goodness, sense of well-being that win over against the negative emotion. In the end, we can debate this until, since we don't have much cows in Singapore, <laughs> I was told by this New Zealand a fellow, when, a New Zealand pastor, when we all make a trip to New Zealand, how, you know, a group of Singaporeans were visiting New Zealand, and they were traveling on a bus, and as a bus went by the road, they see this animal that goes Ooh. and so one Singaporean says cow and they stop the bus all cannot take photos of cow <laughs> but I guess you haven't seen a cow you saw it only in pictures or video on YouTube <laughs> never touch one so all they come touch a cow you know the poor cow say who is all these fellas touching me <laughs> say Singaporeans <laughs> right? touching the cow 
because the cow might have just lap it up. Yeah. He never had so much attention before. And uh, because New, New Zealand, you see sheep and cows everywhere. In fact, there are more sheep than human beings. Right? So the sheep never get any attention. The cow never got any attention. Suddenly, you know, no one on the photograph the cow. But suddenly, can they bust a Singaporean? They have the photograph next to the cow. Oh, then the cow was the president of the United States. <laughs> cow really was very happy that day. But uh, as they, as, uh, uh, all, all these things that we see uh, in terms of, uh, of, the, of the cow and whatever things that are there, <laughs> get back to the topic. Thank you very much. And uh, we, we were discussing, where were we in the cow? I got lost in the cow. I got lost somewhere with the Singaporeans on the bus. I think we got lost somewhere in New Zealand. Right. Oh yes, we're talking about the cow. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Andy. Right, so, you know, uh, we could debate this issue until, since there are no cow, until the cows come home, we could debate until your chassis or burn, <laughs> or your pork belly or dry up, uh, pork belly, you know, meat or whatever. Uh, you could debate until the MRT train or close shop. <laughs> but we will not settle, so the Bible settles it, correct? The root word that sets the whole mind. It says this phronio. The root word phronio comes from the Greek word phron. P H R O N in some versions. Sometimes in some versions they put P H R E N. Friend. And you know what the root word means? Affection and emotion. In Colossians 3 verse 2, in fact verse 1 says, If you then be risen with Christ, set your mind on things above. Purposely, this is Paul writing again, he chose the word phronio again. When he talk about setting, he talk about phronio. And in the old King James, Colossians 3 verse 2 was translated as, set your affection. If they have been consistent, they could. So, phronio, quote unquote, is your emotional mind. You know, there's a part of the mind that runs our emotions. There's a part of the mind that runs logic. The Greek word has a word for it, dialogismos. Then the general word for mind is the word nous. So there's nous, there's phronio, there's dialogismos. And both are a part of the news. But it emphasizes one part of the news. Just like we all know in, in terms of brain development, scientific studies today have shown that the brain doesn't finish developing until the, the child might reach uh, the age of puberty and they grow on into the teens, into their 20s, 21. Their cerebral cortex is the last part to develop. That is why most teenagers do not make decisions based on logic. Now, remember the exceptional cases like Jesus Christ of Nazareth. 12 years old, poor, powerful. His intellect was fully developed, everything, you have no sin nature in him. So there are exceptional cases. So don't, don't generalize that everyone, but uh, everyone, you know, is the same. Generally, this large group is there. So most teenagers, they, they go for the thrills and the emotion. Even though you have a reasoning at the, at the top. You know, people always got some reason. But the real underlying reason is, it feels good. It feels good. Which is why sometimes they do things that we cannot explain. Like how? Like playing the video game until they forgot to eat. No, they can forget to eat. You have newspaper account, just search the internet. How many people play video games until they die of starvation? I think we are the only animal species where, where video games more important than food. And you have accounts, people play. Food is there, sometimes they eat, sometimes they don't eat. 
Then sometimes do it, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> Examine why they died. Starvation. Because of the thrill we have emotionally. We get thrilled when you got more points, more life, you go higher level, higher level. Who one more level? Who one more level? The emotional thrill. Why do people gamble emotional thrill? Not just for the money, the thrill. The thrill of losing and winning. The thrill of being able to win suddenly. There's underlying emotion. Some things we look like intellectual decision. You look at carefully, there is an underlying emotional element. You take away the emotional element. The intellectual one has no satisfaction. And then you can go and join the worldly folk and sing the song, I ain't got no satisfaction. <laughs> right? There is a case of a man, came out in Time Magazine uh, about a decade ago, where the amygdala, which is a part of the brain that, 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 uh, that responds to fear of, of uh, a fight or flee kind of situation, emotional area. And he was a, a very capable man, but his amygdala was, was damaged. And they found his behavior a bit strange. He would keep making the same business mistakes, the same business environments mistake, the same stock market mistake. Like he never learned from his mistake. Why? Because he didn't feel the loss of his mistake. He didn't feel the regret of his mistake. So intellectually, he says, well, the chance is there, 50-50, this and and he still looks good, any day 50-50, you're 49, uh, 51. And intellectually, like a robot, they'll still be able to calculate. But in the end, it's the intellectual satisfaction or dissatisfaction that keeps a person away from something. Or going on to something. Is the feeling of high. Why do we like certain foods? Why do certain things give us pleasure? Endorphins. Serotonin. All those flatness. We got emotions of goodness. Feelings are high. Oxytocin or whatever else. The pleasure all comes up. The adrenaline runs. We get thrilled. Remove all feelings from human beings. And there will be a lot of things that humans don't do anymore. Of course, intellect is still necessary. But when the gorilla of emotion uh, fight with the inter orangutan of intellect, Fronio tells us that the setting of the mind is actually the emotion. When you look at the brain structure, we have this cere cerebral cortex and then we got the, the, the post uh, anterior, posterior, and then you got the two halves of the brain, but it sits on what they call the reptilian brain. Where all your emotions go through. Emotion wind is like a 10,000 pound gorilla. All the time. Now, if the emotions on some area are very small, then your intellect will win. Now, even intellect has its own satisfaction. Do you know why some people like to be intellectual and some people really love doctrine and, uh, and dogma and all this dry stuff? Because they do derive some pleasure from it. And a different type of emotion, different level of emotion. It might make them feel good in those areas. Underlying it, we do things that are motivated and makes us feel good. Now, we should not be ruled by emotions, of course. But we should remember how powerful emotions are. And then, if we must remember which comes first, which comes second. When you don't know which comes first, which comes second, the whole order is fixed up. We must remember. Walking is very simple for us when you are in perfect health. But when you are struggling to walk and you are gaining movement, why does little, little infants and toddlers fall when they walk? Because they are still getting their muscle steady. So the, the process of walking is not like 
your baby all the time, sleep, 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 sleep. One day you get up, I like to walk and start walking. No, it has to develop its muscles to balance and which leg goes forward and which leg goes second, you know. So imagine how to walk. Imagine how the millipede walks. And which leg goes first? And if, it, if the millipede think too much, it will never walk. Supposedly, if it had 100 legs. And which leg go first? Eh? Hey, the, number one, what you cannot, it just have a flow of motion. Have you seen a millipede walking? It's like a curve. The same when they were training, nowadays a lot of operations are based on keyhole surgery and microsurgery through, through a, a, a microscope or through a, through a computer screen. And every movement is very, very, uh, every small movement is a big movement in, a, in a microscopic uh, surgery. And so, so when they were training students, and this is a real case, the, the trainer was training uh, new uh, students in sur surgery technique, and they were trying to use their intellectual mind. Uh, right, left, up a bit, left a bit, left a bit, up a bit, up a bit. And they were so slow. I mean, how do you operate someone? Normal surgery, let's say, takes one hour, you got to think, think how to go. Uh, right thumb, a bit right, a bit more pressure than thumb, less pressure, new pressure, good pressure. Uh, you cannot. The one hour surgery might take 10 hours of patient die long ago. <laughs> so in the end, the trainer says, don't think, just feel and do. Just feel and go with the flow. And it, it's still an intellectual process, but it goes back to your subconscious, not to your cerebral cortex. We cannot handle everything. Imagine if your cerebral cortex had to handle your temperature of your body, and uh, your intake of food, all your cell function, all your organ function, your heartbeat, and, uh, and your heart pressure, and how much uh, 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 alkali acidity in your body, and all this function, your, your the cerebral cortex will, will crash. Too much information. Cannot handle. So we handle the little bits that help us choose. And that is why it tells us that it is not the law. Why? Because what is the law? The law serves the mind. Now, I am not against intellectual development. Intellectual development is important. It is part of growth. Because the more you understand, the more you climb to another place so that you can launch a new set of quote-unquote emotions, or higher emotions. By higher emotions, I mean more spiritualized emotions. And uh, so, in the book of Romans 7, you notice know we talk about the, the fight between the body and, uh, and the spirit. What did he say about the mind? He says, he says something, well, it's just next door, so look at Romans chapter 7. It says in verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind, news, the word news here, with the news, I myself serve the law of God. So what does it mean, the mind serve the law of God? It means it is good to know the law. Because understanding helps. And how are the two balance? It's like this. You always have nature and nurture, correct? And now, uh, when you talk about nature, it's not an intellectual process. When you talk about nurture, intellect is involved. As far as we humans are concerned, we don't go just by instinct. We are also got some training to correct wrong methods that would delay us. So to nurture, or let's replace the word nurture with train. To train, we need education. And so we need both. Because nature will need to be nurtured. And after nurturing, it might bring you to a higher nature, higher development process. Like for example, uh, we, we all take breathing so easily. But do you know that you got two voices? Your voice is done by your voice box. 
And most of us generally have two types of voices. When we are nervous, you speak with your throat. <laughs> when you are relaxed, you speak with your diaphragm. And so we normally you notice that in our conversation we alternate between the two voices with a little bit of things in between. Sometimes it's low, sometimes it's high. Technically, when you sing or you speak, you cannot use a throat voice. However, if all your life you're always speaking with a throat, and uh, when you say hello, you go for, after this we go for lunch, and after lunch we will discuss what food to eat, and over lunch we look at the menu, and I'm ordering the a la carte things, and all the time I'm speaking like that, it's weird. <laughs> Nobody speaks with a diaphragm all the time, right? Uh, and sometimes it sounds friendlier when you're using your throat voice. A little bit of diaphragm proportion, and so, uh, so we are just two voices that we are playing all the time in our conversation. In the same way that, that we need to also understand that the emotional development, the emotional intelligence, is as important as IQ. IQ is important, but EQ is also important. And understanding of emotions and how they flow. Some people, big IQ, small EQ, unsuccessful. Why? They may be the best technician, the best engineer, but cannot get along with everybody, nobody wants to hire them. End up a pauper on the street without money to eat. And uh, without food to eat because no money. And some people, high EQ. Oh. They can sense everybody's emotions, but very low IQ. All they could do is very simple tasks. Also, it's handicap. So we need both to develop, but the key is to understand when both come together, which influence the other. Because the greater will influence the lesser. Let me give you an example. We always can help, and you can also when you hear this message, every young one who struggles in their study. You know now exam times? Yeah, now it's examining exam times. Or, or maybe some of them, the exams are over. November, December. So they're mugging, studying, oh, attention. Your mind works better when you're relaxed. The more dense you are, you try to tell yourself you must memorize and you must memorize and you stay up late, memorize, burn the midnight oil and everything and nearly burn your house down at the same time. And so, and you find that all your mugging, you still cannot remember. Then the guy, easy going, relax. Look at it. Look at what he has to remember. Okay. Then after some time, he plays a football game or volleyball, comes back, cleans himself, bathes nicely, go and look at it again. Ah. And then after that, goes and uh, no, uh, play music, enjoys himself, come back, look at it again. Ah. And then he memorizes it when he's trying to memorize. And that is why also there are many kids who don't do well in school, not because they don't have IQ, but because they got emotional problems at home. Emotional problems in their life. So when we understand the greater influencing the lesser, when you take care of the greater, then you take care of the other. Okay, when you're on an airline, and they, they, they always give this thing, and uh, uh, in case of, a, uh, of a depressurization, the oxygen mask will drop in front of you. <laughs> and if you have a child, who puts on the mask first? Let's see whether you remember. The adult first, correct? They always say the adult put on first. Then you put on for the child. Why? Because if sudden depressurization and really the oxygen runs out, you put on for the child, the adult dies. <laughs> Who's going to help the child? Child cannot help themselves. So you put on for the adult, and then you stick it. You are alive to help the child because the child cannot reach. <laughs> and the child doesn't know what to do also when the plane crash. 
and all these other things. So the adults. So to know which is first, which is second is important. There are many things in life like that. And, and we need to uh, learn that. And in the afternoon service, we talk about uh, little simple things that we could train uh, uh, the consciousness so that you know how to keep your consciousness in the spirit level. But for now, we have touched on the debates of these two and talk about how we, we seal it once again that the Bible answers and tell you the emotional mind is sitting influencing the intellectual mind. The intellectual mind is important. With the mind, I serve the law of God. To bring you, once you understand the law of God, you can go higher in another dimension. So I would say both are important developments. But to know which comes first when it comes to our thoughts. And uh, so, the, so remember, even in conversation, now you know, words, thoughts carry emotion. As I say, a word has three dimensions. It has a picture dimension, it has an emotion dimension, it has an intellectual dimension. But the emotional carries a lot. It is not what is the content of what you say that is important. It is important, of course. But that's not the only important how you say it carries the greater weight. And children respond differently. So you can help every child who is having a problem with studying. Or even if you yourself are entering school all over again, studying for your PhD or whatever still, and you got to get yourself in a relaxed mode. But of course some people so relax. <laughs> don't study. We're not talking about that, you know. Uh, no. But you, you have to have emotional balance in order to have intellectual capacity. If your emotions are imbalanced, no matter how great your IQ is, you could be like a bitter, high, highly educated person. Also bad. And then because of your bitterness or your dogmatic, uh, dogmatism, you are not open to other ideas also. Because you might be emotionally invested in one point of view. Just like many Christians are actually in emotionally invested in their tradition, in their denomination, in their church. We, we advocate loyalty in church, but we always say, visit every church you want. Because we got no problem you visiting every church you want. Because we are confident enough that you find your way back if you belong to here. But many pastors, oh, don't go there, don't go here, don't go there, don't go here. Just stay with me. <laughs> Out of fear. And people cannot grow. So it's happening even in adult life. And in the end, what is important? And I just give the three keys. That we, that we need the three keys that control will, emotion, and, and uh, intellect. And I have to give it so that we just close nicely. I, in your emotions, the greatest establishment or the highest emotion you can feel is love. Love will produce peace and joy everything. Love. So always love is important. Unconditional love. And love from God. So cultivate that as a basic default mode. In the intellect, uh, cultivate uh, the word of God in your life. Because you say with the with the mind you serve, you know who is serving who? The law of God. The law of God is the word of God. So, unless there's sufficient input of the word, remember what the word does, it divides between soul and spirit. Hebrews 4 verse 12. The word cleanses. Look at the end of Hebrews 12. What is the last phrase says? It says, it discerns the intents and the thoughts of the heart. See, the word is a discerner. It protects you. And if you know me very well, I'm, I'm hungry for knowledge. I research on everything under the sun. I, I avail myself of all, all information. I will analyze it. But 
I will always come back to the Word. That's how I cut off wastage of time. If the information start going off the Word, not interested. But when you research in area that the Word already clear you for, it's easier to look for your needle in a haystack. Because you've got only one bundle of haystack to look for, not the whole bundle. And so the word will tell you which information is important. Which one is true knowledge and truth, while the others are just lies or impartial knowledge. So with the mind or intellect, serve the law, word of God. So you have love, the word. And then your will must be surrendered. Only a surrendered will, which is why Romans 12 comes in. How is it that verse 1 and verse 2 are related? Verse 1 said, present your body as a living sacrifice, right? Then verse 2 talk about renewal of the mind. So where there's a surrenderedness of the will, renewal of the mind by the word, love in the emotions, you can remain in the holy of holies. Because that is the environment of holiness. You need to know the environment. If your mind is against God's word, what do you say? The carnal mind is enmity against God. You think you can go into the Holy of Holies? Your mind will fry. You want to go near. God is love. If you have any other emotions but love, you cannot get into the Holy of Holies. And there's only one will allowed, not our rebellious will. God, you know what God says in Isaiah 54? All of our thoughts cannot compete with His. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, His ways are higher than our ways. So what do we do? We have to take His thoughts first. Our highest thoughts cannot compare with God. So that is why we must surrender our will. And in fact, He also said, all the thoughts of man are vanity. You're so vain. So vain. <laughs> right, okay. Talking okay, about how all of us in our eye nature, we are vain. Really? Yes. Before you come to church, don't you think that guy looking at you from the, uh, the guy, the gal looking at you from the mirror was pretty good looking. <laughs> so, in the sense, all our will our will has a will drawing attention to itself. The will must die. The will must bang into a sea. Crash it. So the will must be surrendered to be inside. Inside the holy of holy, there's only one will. Capital W. God's will. Anything outside God's will defiles the holiness of God. So these three environments are important to exist. Now, that, so it's so easy now to triangulate God's presence. Whenever God is present, love is present. Whenever God is present, His Word is present. Whenever God is present, His will is present. And the greater the presence, the greater all three are. And you can try and get the presence of God. Go to any place, any meeting, read any book, hear any message, and know whether God is present or He's absent. And how you can maintain a consciousness of the presence of God. You know, people want to practice the presence of God. So they read Brother Lawrence. After reading Brother Lawrence, they say, Hey, how? Uh? <laughs> Have you noticed you read Brother Lawrence, it doesn't tell you how? Okay, tell me, some of you read Brother Lawrence. Which wrote, who wrote about the practice of the presence of God. Okay, what was his key? <laughs> you can't tell me. It's a thin little book, easy to read. You could read it in, in, in less than an hour. The practice of the presence of God by Brother Lawrence, a monk who lived long ago. He practiced the presence of God. What was that? I'm conscious of God's presence. But how was he conscious? He didn't tell you how. See, he didn't tell you how. He said, I must be conscious of God. I must be conscious of God. But you must be conscious of God. In the end, you're conscious that you must be conscious of the conscious of God. 
but you were not conscious of God. <laughs> you miss it by a mile. You were conscious that you must be conscious of the consciousness of God. But in the midst of trying to be conscious of the consciousness of the conscious of God, you miss the conscience, consciousness of God. In the end, focus on the love of God. The word of God in every thought. Or in line with the word of God. Every thought must be in line with the word. Not necessarily the scripture and words. And your real bang always. Not my will but thine. Always keep your will back. You will find the presence of God. So the presence of God not not necessarily something eerie. Oh, my hair is standing up. <laughs> no, when you want your hair to stand up, I just blow a cold fresh tube. Right? So, those are side effects. Come on. Not just God's presence when your hair stand. Ghost stories when your hair stand. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in the book of Job, spoken by some of the other writers, uh, the other speakers, uh, it says, you know, a spirit came and my hair stand up. Yes, it's in the Bible. <laughs> But not the right spirit, not the wrong spirit. I, I, I never quoted it because it's not spoken by one of those that got sanctioned. Uh, you know, the three friends of Job. Who got rebuked. But they mentioned the hair standing up. And, uh, because the spirit was present. So, all this are side effect. The main thing is the consciousness of God. And maintain your consciousness of God. It's not a thought necessary. Sometimes you, you go from the word side. You know there are three angles. When you triangulate, you can go from either angle, X, Y, or Z. You can start from any point. But all three must be functional to actually space or rather uh, be the exact consciousness that you have or the consciousness of God. Praise God. Alright, so... One final thing I know, hour is getting late and your stomach is getting hungry. <laughs> but one very practical thing. Uh, you can move your ear, right? Can you come here a while? Okay. Before they go, flap your ears for them. <laughs> Before you go, so Eddie, flap your ears. Now, Eddie and I are going to flap our ears. There you go. Eddie, are you flapping your ears? Can you see my ears flapping? Not really flapping, I'm flapping a bit too much, right? So moving, moving. I have to concentrate. Okay, got it? Can you see it? Yes. Eddie can. Okay, now how many of you cannot flap your ears or move your ears? I need a volunteer. You can't? Okay, come, 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 come. Okay. No, no, come, come. Come, okay. okay. Any, another one, I saw one more hand going up. Uh, I think sisters cannot flap ears. Will you you raise your hand up? Okay, let's have the other sister come. Okay. Okay, make sure the video is on time before you leave, right? This is, this is your lunch break thing. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Do you know how, which muscle I move? I'll tell you which muscle I move. Okay. Uh, okay, you can, you, you try, and everyone, when you down there can do, and those of your mind can do. Smile without opening your mouth first. Make a big smile without opening your mouth. You know, you move your lips. The side of your lips. Okay. Now, of course, I can't see whether your ear moves because it's hiding behind your life. Right? But, uh, but you could feel your ear moving. Okay, When you smile without moving your... I'll tell you exactly which muscle. When you smile without move, opening your mouth. Okay. Okay. So you're used to this side of the muscle. Then when you contact that muscle, you concentrate on the muscle alone. Okay. Hey, did your ears move a bit? You're not sure yet? Okay, okay. But between now and the second sermon, for those of you who are coming back, at lunch time, practice your ears. <laughs> but I would love to hear some of your story. This is just, just a something funny, and you know, all we got fun also. And uh, that uh, with training, I can actually help you move your ears. Of course, some of you say, what benefit does it have? <laughs> right? I don't know what benefit it has. It just probably discover a hidden muscle that you didn't know you have. And, uh, but an easier thing, okay, okay. Uh, how many of you can do this with your hands? How many cannot do this? Part the middle one, you know, like the walker sign, live long and prosper. Okay, you can. Uh, at least you cannot, right? Or you got, you will not, but the two hands must be touching, the two sides must be touching. Okay. 
Difficult, right? Some of you can do it, some cannot, no? And you know why? It's a simple trick. Because if you do it with your hands outstretched, it's very, very tough. So you first do it when your hand is bent inwards. Your hand bent inwards first. And then make sure it's tight. When your hand is bent inwards, bend this way. Oh yeah, yes, it's okay. Okay, bend your hand first. Just relax your hand and bend it. Bend it. No, 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 no. You didn't bend it and this way. Just, just bend it. And then when you bend, ah, this one can do, right? So when your hand is bent, you can do. Your hand can bend. And when your hand is bent, then you slowly straighten it. Voila! See? So, it's a simple method of training. Now, this is for my illustration. Consciousness of God is a training of your consciousness. Got it? So, you learn to always be conscious of love. Conscious that every thought you have must be in line with the word. When the loose thoughts come. You don't always have check, 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 you know? No, relax. And then let it float. And if a whole group of that, you cannot check everyone. I mean, you're not the custom officer or the immigration. <laughs> There's no immigration on your thoughts there, you know? And every thought needs a passport. No, no passport sent back, right? No. Uh, no. So, generally, when a whole group of thoughts go in a direction that is outside the world, let it go. Don't think. And uh, this is in the Bible, Philippians chapter 4, after verse 7 and 8, where you say the peace of God can in your heart and mind. Whatsoever things are good, have yes. virtue, honor, glory, honor, whatever, mm -hmm. think on these things. Because these things lead you to practice the presence of God. And then surrenderness is easy. You just always say, oh, to Jesus, I surrender. And you, and you believe in it. And so, when these three are in your life, you triangulate your consciousness and you practice the consciousness of God, you will be like the Holy of Holies walking around. So once in a while, as you walk the Holy of Holies, you see the sick person, you turn around with a slight whisper, in the name of Jesus. And then you walk on and the paralyzed man got up and walked. Because <laughs> the presence of God is in your life. Praise God. So we have fun. Praise God. Let's give Jesus a good clap of praise.